You're listening to Plane Crash, the book by Michael Diamond as retold to the kids of the Watertown SDA Church Junior Sabbath School. This is a story of one man's survival and God's faithful, miraculous rescuing power. Let's go. Except for the gentle rustle of the wind, all was silent. Mike's eyes fluttered open. He was slumped over in his seat. With a great effort, he lifted his head and tried to look around, but darkness dimmed his vision. The sun was setting beyond the ridges, and dark mountain shadows were all about. The plane had crashed into a canyon wall at an elevation of about 5,000 feet, but instead of tumbling to the canyon floor, which would have been a fall of about 600 feet, the plane perched like a huge dragonfly on a tiny shelf sticking out from the wall. Chaparral bushes lined the juncture where the shelf met the canyon wall, and these bushes had softened the plane's impact, too. Mike was groggy. He looked at the chaparral leaves hungrily. The thought crossed his mind to eat them. It was unreal. He had no memory of anything. He didn't even remember whether he was a man or an animal. He gazed in the rearview mirror. He saw an unfamiliar face dark with dried blood. The left eyelid was still dripping, fresh blood coagulating on top of dried blood like candle wax. Fresh blood erupted through the crust on other parts of his face. What is that? He wondered. Moments passed in confusion. Who am I? How did I get here? He looked around some more. Looks like a crashed airplane, Mike thought, uncomprehending. I must be dreaming. He tried to wake up, but he couldn't. If I'm not dreaming, what am I doing in a crashed plane? It was so hard to think straight. It was like being awakened in the middle of the night while you're on vacation in a strange hotel and you can't figure out where you are. Only worse. He did his best to concentrate. Finally, he could remember his name. And then he remembered his trip to San Francisco. <gasps> That's right. I was flying back from my folks, and then everything came back to him. He remembered facing the wall of rock, and how he thought he was dead before he finally crashed on the side of the canyon wall. Suddenly, a well of joy sprang up inside him. He looked in the mirror on the panel again, and this time he could see a row of white teeth in his blood-darkened face. He was smiling. I'm alive, he exclaimed. Praise God, I'm going to make it. Suddenly, he was aware of incredible pain. It jabbed through his chest and arms like a sword. His upper left arm and shoulder had been shattered like a jigsaw puzzle when he slammed against the door on impact, and both of his lower forearms were also broken. Mike groaned as he looked at his twisted left arm and winced as he repositioned it on his lap. On the floor of the plane, he saw his watch ticking towards 7 o'clock. The band had been torn apart in the crash. It looked as though some crazed rat had chewed on it. He'd been unconscious perhaps an hour, with maybe five minutes spent trying to make sense out of things, getting his memory back. Mike looked around slowly in the dim light. The canyon walls dropped away on both sides of the plane. The wings and tail of the plane hung out over the tiny shelf. Through the rear window, he could see he was pretty far up from the floor of the canyon. The air cooled as it got dark. The winds started flowing upward from the canyon. The plane rocked back and forth, making a crunching sound like an old wooden ship. I hope this baby stays up here on the shelf, Mike worried. If it slides off, I'll be a goner for sure. The door on his side was jammed open. On the steep grade outside, he could see a suitcase and other belongings that had been thrown out on impact. One of the things he noticed beside the plane was the steering wheel. How did that get out there, he wondered. He remembered how a friend's brother, who had been a pilot, had been killed in a plane crash when the steering wheel went through his chest on impact. But in Mike's case, the whole steering wheel with the column attached to it had evidently made a clean break and exited the cockpit before Mike slammed into the dashboard. Mike shivered. Where's my jacket? He looked around and lay outside the open door, just a teasingly short distance from him. I wonder if I could reach it. As the sun's rays disappeared, the temperature plunged. Even though it was nearly spring, snow fields still hung on the northern slopes. The terrain looks steep and rough, Mike thought. I'd better wait till morning so I can see what's going on. The radio, Mike exclaimed to himself. I wonder if I can get it to work. Oh, I sure would like to help them find me faster. Ah, oh, nothing. Mike fiddled with the dials. It's dead. I wish I could let Anne Louise know that I'm alive. Then he remembered the Emergency Locator Transmitter, or ELT, that all planes are required to carry. It is a little box with a long antenna that sends off a directional signal when it gets a heavy jolt. It's usually mounted in the tail section of the aircraft, but this one had been mounted in the baggage compartment right behind Mike's seat. He couldn't see it at all. Oh, I hope it's working. Then he was thunderstruck by a horrible realization. I crashed south of San Luis Obispo. He had not been able to reach the Oakland Flight Service on the radio to let them know that he had changed his fuel stop. 
That meant when the searchers started looking for him, they would first check with San Luis Obispo Airport to see if he'd made it that far. And when they found out he hadn't stopped there, they would think that he crashed north of there. But he was south. It might take him longer to find me, I thought, but I'll be found. The Lord is with me. By this time, Mike couldn't see anything in the darkness, so he decided to lie down. He swung himself around and dangled his lower legs out the open door on the pilot's side. With even the slightest movement, pain would flash up from his arms and through his body like lightning. Mike tried to prop his head against the opposite door, but every maneuver sent waves of pain hurtling through his body. This is probably the best I can do, he thought as he lay across the seats. The icy winds compounded his misery. He didn't have much to shield him from the cold, only his turtleneck sweater and jeans. The sweater helped some, but still he shivered. He had no food or water. He tucked his useless left arm under the seatbelt to keep it stable. Lord, I prayed, be with those who are looking for me. Help them to find me soon. I don't know how long I can survive up here. Mike called, Linda said when Anne Louise returned from lunch. He'll be landing at Flabob around 6.30 tonight. He said he'll call when he arrives. Then you can pick him up. Thanks, Anne Louise replied. She walked into her office. I have only a few things to do, Anne Louise thought, looking at the paperwork on her desk. I'll get done what I can now, do some shopping, and then go home to wait for Mike's call. And Louise got home just before 6.30 and puttered around, expecting to hear the phone ring at any moment. About that time, Mike was wishing that he could let her know that he was alive. She began to worry about not receiving his call. It is getting pretty close to 8 o'clock, she worried. I should have heard from him by now. I'll check with Elaine. She flipped through the phone book, but she couldn't remember the instructor's last name. Now, maybe the airport has her phone number. But as she looked through the phone book, she remembered that Mike had to call the Ontario Flight Service for information about his flight. They kept track of flight plans that pilots would file. Now, your husband should be landing any moment, Mrs. Chambers, said someone at the flight service. Thank you, I'll wait for his call. But there was no phone call. An awful feeling started growing inside her with each passing minute. She tried to busy herself with other things, but it didn't stop the panic slowly engulfing her. Mike knew how much she worried and was always very careful to reassure her of his safety. Dear Lord, and Louise prayed, please be with him. The minutes ticked slowly by to nine o'clock. Still no call. Again, she called the flight service. Hello, she said anxiously. This is Anne Louise Chambers. My husband Mike hasn't called. Mrs. Chambers, we've started a communications check at the airport along his proposed flight path to see if he made an unscheduled landing. Why would he do that? She asked. Pilots have been known to land at airports along their routes to visit friends or relatives without letting us know about it. Mike wouldn't stop without notifying anyone, she said. We do a communications check first. If it turns out negative, then an air search is started. I assure you, Mrs. Chambers, we'll contact you as soon as we learn anything. Discovering they had already started a search unnerved Anne Louise even further. She went over and over in her mind any eventuality other than a crash. Could he have possibly stopped over anywhere? Would he stop at Santa Barbara to visit his sister? No. She forced herself to wait until 10 o'clock before calling again, but that was merely a repeat of her 9 o'clock call. And Louise's mind kept going in circles. What could be happening to Mike? Something's wrong. He might be dead. If he's not dead, whatever's happened, he needs help. Where could he be? She felt so helpless and lost and not knowing. Just weeks before, a plane that had crashed 17 years earlier had finally been discovered in the mountains near their home. When no call had come by 11 o'clock, her mind had fully exhausted any possibilities other than a crash. Again, she called the flight service. Ontario Flight Service? Someone answered. She clenched her fists and breathed deeply for a moment in order to talk without breaking down, but as soon as she spoke, her composure dissolved. <laughs> this is Henry's chambers, she sobbed. Could anything have happened other than a crash? Oh, yes, the attendant said encouragingly. Sometimes a pilot hears something strange in the engine and decides to sit down at a small airstrip and check it out. If the airstrip is closed, he might not be able to get to a phone to let anyone know he's there. Or there might not be an airstrip and he might decide to land in a field. That would make getting to a phone even harder, but of course, it would mean he's still all right. It didn't sound very reassuring. How long would a plane float? She asked, if it crashed in the ocean. Uh, it depends on whether or not the gas tanks were full, he answered. If the tanks were nearly empty, the plane would float longer than if the tanks had just been filled. Yeah. <laughs> what about the emergency locator transmitter? Would it give a signal underwater? How long might an oil slick last? A uh, signal couldn't be as strong underwater, and how long an oil slick remains would depend on the amount of fuel spilled and the condition of the sea. Later on, she learned that his answers were somewhat misleading, even if they were well-intentioned. According to Air Force personnel she talked to later, a Cessna 150 plane, like what Mike was flying, has the flotation properties of a brick. And with the exception of highly skilled and experienced pilots, a pilot almost invariably is stunned by the impact of the landing gear hitting the water and goes down with the plane in seconds. I'll call Mike's folks, she decided, but being so upset she couldn't find the number that Mike had given her the afternoon before, so she called Mike's brother Alan. Hello, Lynn answered. Anne Louise couldn't talk. She tried, but only garbled words came out. 
who is this? Lynn asked. And Louise, is that you? What's the matter? And Louise finally choked out that Mike had not arrived and she couldn't find his parents' number. Is anyone with you? Lynn asked. No, she sobbed. Call someone to stay with you, Anne Louise. I'll call Mike's dad. Anne Louise hung up. It's late, Anne Louise thought. What could anyone do? She didn't realize what a comfort it would be to just have someone with her. After her 11 o'clock call, she started receiving calls from the rescue station at McClellan Air Force Base, the center that coordinated initial search efforts for missing planes. They asked her many questions. What was his experience? They asked. Nearly 40 hours of flying, she answered. Would he be likely to make any side trips? No. Was there anyone he might have stopped to visit? No. Might he have had anything alcoholic to drink before taking off? No, he doesn't drink. Do you know anything that might give us a clue as to where to look? No. These questions she answered over and over again. At each new shift change, they called her back to ask the same questions. She learned later from the Civil Air Patrol manual that the victim's family should be questioned only once and the information passed on to units and shifts needing it. But even though she had to answer the same questions over and over, she didn't mind. They reassured her that someone was doing something. Aunt Louise, Mike's dad was on the phone. What's happening? Aunt Louise filled him in on all that she knew. Now, he's not a daredevil, Mike's dad said. He's very cautious about his flying. Whatever might have happened, they knew Mike would have been using his best judgment. They remembered how carefully Mike followed regulations as he knew them. When he bucked headwinds on the flight up, he had radioed to the flight service to extend his flight plan. Soon after Mike's dad hung up, the flight service called again. The communication check turned up negative. Tomorrow we'll start a physical search on the ground and from the air. But if he's down, he needs help now, Anne Louise said. It's dark, was the reply. We'll start at sunrise. It's best not to crash after office hours, apparently. An air search cannot start until every airstrip along the flight path verifies by a physical check that the plane in question is not at their airfield. So once an airfield is closed, it's difficult to reach anyone there to go out and check to see if the plane is on their airfield or not. Knowing sleep would be difficult, Anne Louise settled herself on the living room hide bed so she would be close to the downstairs phone should it ring during the night. And Louise prayed and dozed off around 2 o'clock Friday morning. You've been listening to Plane Crash by Michael Diamond. If you're enjoying the story so far, tune in for the next chapter. And meanwhile, you can visit my YouTube channel where you'll find stories like these. Bible stories, mission stories, as well as Bible and history skits for kids and adults. See you next time.